Hello carnivores, SP fam. Welcome back to the channel. It's me, Bella the Steak and Butter Gal. I hope you all are having a Gouda meat fuel day so far. Today's video will feature my guest, Dr. Anthony Chafee. He is a former All-American rugby player, and now he is currently pursuing his career as a neurosurgeon in Perth, Australia. So in this video, you will learn Dr. Anthony Chafee's hard and fast rules on how to live the most optimal life. This includes optimal mental function, optimal physical performance. Dr. Chafee also shares his strong belief in why 100% pure carnivore is essential, why it is harmful and dangerous to consume any plant foods at all. And finally, I do want to announce that Dr. Chafee will be one of my April challenge guest speakers in addition to Dr. Ken Berry, Dr. Robert Kiltz, and Rebecca Farmer. If you guys are interested in attending all of these guest speaker calls where you guys can submit your questions for these fantastic, brilliant guests, please do go to sbgmeetup.com to sign up or click the link down below to read more on the details. So without further ado, let me invite on my special guest, Dr. Anthony Chafee. Welcome, Dr. Chafee. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for being here. I will start off with a question that's more about your career change. I'm just so interested how you went mm. from being an all-American rugby player to a neurosurgeon. Mm. Uh, well, so, so training in neurosurgery. So I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm done with that yet, but, um, yeah, well, I always, I was always interested in, in medicine. I always wanted to be a, a doctor since I was a little kid. And so that was, you know, just always in the back of my head. Um, you know, I think that, you know, when I was telling people this, they're, they, they think like, oh, okay, yeah, well, yeah, whatever, because that's like the classic med school, yes. uh, you know, application sort of, uh, questionnaire. I was like, oh, I've always wanted to be a doctor ever since I was a kid. And I'm yes. just, you know, I just I love, you know, you know, petting butterflies and helping <laughs> sick animals, all these sort of nonsense. But I always wanted to be a doctor since I was a kid. And I was very interested in surgery and, and figuring out how to you know, fix people's bodies from the inside and fix them physically with wow. your hands. I've always just thought that was just the most amazing thing uh, mm -hmm. that, that you could do. But I also really loved sports. I always loved athletics and I had some opportunities in rugby. I was an all American and then was traveling and going to New Zealand, you know, with the national team and then had opportunities to play in England and, and abroad. And, and so I was just like, well, you know, I'm a bit ahead of the game with uh, my education. And so I, I, I could stand to take a few years off and see, you know, where rugby goes. And so I ended up taking 10 years off and, um, wow. and, uh, playing professionally for, for 10 years, but, you know, I really enjoyed that, but, um, it was sort of in the back of my head the whole time. I, I would actually get very anxious. You know, I remember, you know, being in England at the champions league and, and absolutely having a, a fantastic time. And then, you know, living a life that, that a lot of people would be very envious of, yes. but in the back of my head, I was just like, I should be in medical school. Now I should be finishing medical school. Now I should be starting, you know, and it, it was like, I was like, my own tiger mom in the back of my head, just going like, why aren't you doing this? You know, I literally sometimes have like sleepless nights where I would just be so anxious yeah. uh, thinking about this, that I, I actually couldn't sleep. I was up for the 2003 world cup and I ended up breaking my leg just before the, the trials. And so I wasn't able to compete for that. And that devastated me because I was in, I was in such good shape. I was actually doing carnivore at the time. And I was just a machine physically was probably the, the peak that I've ever been and ever will be. I mean, I could literally sprint a marathon. I remember thinking, I was like, I should just enter a marathon because I think I could probably break a world record my first go because I could, I could be at a dead sprint for just forever because I was in such good shape. I, I wore, I was in, I was on carnivore. So my body worked a lot better, but I pushed myself so hard yes. for so long that I got in absolutely incredible shape. And people are saying that, well, you're not going to be able to make it and you're not going to be able to play high level rugby again. And so I'm like, well, you know, we'll see about that. And that's when I went and just went over to England and just, just started playing over there and just showing that I could, I was in the running for the 2007 world cup. Wow. And then I broke my hand. And so like the two wow. bones I've ever broken, which I don't, I don't break bones. They all happened just like right before world cups. At that point I said, right, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this again. And, you know, spend another four years of being extremely anxious that I'm not in medical school to then go for another, uh, another world cup. So I just, you know, I'll still play rugby as much as I can, but I need to shift my, my priorities you know, to, to medical school. So at that point, you know, I started, you know, studying for my MCATs and, 
and doing applications and, and uh, everything like that. And so I ended up going to medical school, but I kept playing rugby. I was still playing rugby at a high level. I was playing in the U S super league. So that was, that was sort of my transition was always wanting to do medicine, but also having opportunities with sports that I wanted to take advantage of, because you can always, you can always go back to school. You can't always, you know, play sports at a high level. Wow. So everything worked out for you at the end. So you still get to be a doctor. You can still play rugby. That is awesome. So now you are currently practicing in Australia. I am. Yeah. So in Perth, Australia, I ended up leaving my uh, training program for a family emergency. My, my parents were just having issues and I I felt that I wasn't able to help them uh, to the extent that I, I needed to remotely while I was taking time off. I got approached by a humanitarian organization called direct relief. Um, and they were told me about this humanitarian crisis in, mm-hmm. in Bangladesh, whereas in, in Burma now, now called Myanmar, uh, there was a genocide and they, the unofficial numbers are they killed about 200,000 people in a, in a span of about a month in September, 2017, you know, nearly a million people that were just living under tarp. Some of the, the stories that we heard directly from these people were, were, were pretty horrific, like, like Holocaust level evil sort of things, you know, oh, just being wow. just lined up and they just execute 2,500 people and, and just throw them in a mass grave. And, you know, it wasn't one of the, like the sexy humanitarian crises, like, you yeah. know, Haiti or, or Nepal, it was just a real one. Mm-hmm. And um, so it didn't really get the, the national international media attention that these other ones would have. And also, you know, Bangladesh was very, very dangerous. It's just very dangerous country. And obviously, you know, not a lot of people wanted to go, which is, which is why I felt that I needed to go. No one needed me over in Nepal or Haiti because there there was an abundance of people there. In fact, there was probably too many people there and they were taking up a lot of the resources that that really needed to go to the locals. So I I never felt interested in going to those sorts of things. This one, you know, I I felt that I, that I needed to just because no one else was really going. Mm -hmm. And I figured that every person that I saw, every patient that I saw would not get seen otherwise. And I really couldn't justify not going, even if it, you know, meant risking my life, because how many people would I see that wouldn't get seen and and potentially, you know, die because they didn't, they didn't get to see somebody. I didn't think that I could ethically not go. So throughout this whole progression of you being a rugby player to you becoming a doctor at a refugee camp to now pursuing a career in neurosurgery, I would love to know how your diet evolved throughout this whole time span. Yeah. So I, I started playing rugby when I was, I was 17 and then playing sort of professionally since then until starting medical school at 29. Sort of first started doing carnivore was early on when I was in college, took cancer biology in, in University of Washington. And, you know, we're learning about how, you know, plants use, use, you know, chemical deterrents to uh, protect themselves, which is a very normal thing. We were looking at it from a cancer perspective and, you know, finding out that, you know, things like Brussels sprouts had 136 known human carcinogens in them. And, you know, mushrooms had over a hundred and spinach, kale, lettuce, celery, cabbage, cucumber, broccoli, whatever, you name it. Yeah. They all had dozens of, of carcinogens in them. And, you know, what is a carcinogen? A carcinogen is something that, you know, may cause cancer down the, down the line, but, you know, cancer is, is formed from a lot of different things going wrong. And, you know, this can be thought of as a, as a metabolic issue and, and screwing up the, the cellular uh, respiration and metabolism of your cell. And this causes things to go wrong and then go down cancer. And there's also the, uh, so there's the metabolic theory of cancer There's also the genetic theory of cancer, where you get these specific mm-hmm. genetic mutations and that, that bounces along, and then you, you end up getting metastatic cancer whatever's happening, something's going wrong. And so if something's a carcinogen, that means that it's, it's, it's disrupting the integral nature of your, of your cellular function. Mm -hmm. So whether or not you get cancer, this is causing problems the whole time. So we look at it from a cancer perspective, but this means that, you know, this thing is, you know, for it to cause cancer 20 years down the line, it is causing problems every single day before that. Yes. And so this isn't good. And so that was a bit of a wake up for all of us, a bit of a shock, really. We thought he, he must be joking mm-hmm. that, um, that, you know, that, that plants are this bad, but, you know, he really wasn't. And I remember, you know, everyone was just looking around wildly, like this has to be a joke, looking for like a TA in the corner, like, you know, yeah. chuckling or you know, snickering or something like that. Yeah. And you're like, ah, oh, he does this all the time, you know? <laughs> But uh, there wasn't, and uh, everyone was just sort of dawned on him, like, "Oh my God, this guy's serious." Wow. And I remember thinking in my head, I was like, "Okay, but 
plant, you know, vegetables are still good for you though. Right. And he just looked at us and he was like, I don't eat any salads. Oh. I don't eat vegetables. <laughs> I don't let my kids eat vegetables. Mm-hmm. Plants are trying to kill you. So I was like, right, screw plants. And I just stopped, you know, and I just, you know, I just went to the store and like, you know, tried to find uh, every, anything that didn't have a plant. And I was just shocked. There's was aisle after aisle after aisle. Everything had a plant or grains or, you know, something involved with it. And I was like, what the hell is going on here? Mm-hmm. And so I ended up, you know, going, you know, whole food carnivore without realizing it. I just, you know, I just came across eggs. I was like, okay, eggs, that doesn't have a plant in it. You know, meat, that doesn't have plants in it. Yes. Milk, milk doesn't have plants in it. Right. So I just ate eggs, meat, and milk for years after that. I was at, at another level of fitness and endurance, uh, even from, from just from anybody else that, that I played with. And then when I was in England, I sort of fell off of that because some of the, you know, the food was breaded and I was just like, well, is it, is that big of a deal? If it's, if it's bread, it was just easy. It was just more convenient. Um, there was just sort of different access to food there. A couple months into it, I remember just being more achy, having just these niggling injuries and, uh, just not feeling my best. And I didn't, I didn't realize it until, over a decade later when, you know, I came across information that shows that like, no humans actually are carnivores. This is the actual, this is actually the kind of animal that we are biologically. And this is our, you know, biologically appropriate uh, diet. And I was like, that's what I was doing. That's the difference. I came on, I was doing carnivore then. And then I came off of it there. And, and that was the difference. And I was like, right. I knew it. I knew plants were trying to kill me, like get rid of these stupid plants. And, and I just went full carnivore after that and, and yeah. really dug into the research and really dug into the literature to see exactly what we knew and exactly what we could prove. So you mentioned that uh, you are always trying to chase like physical performance, top mental clarity. That's very similar to me too, because I'm a musician. So I'm mm-hmm. always trying to tweak around, uh, play with certain things to optimize my mental clarity. Uh, how can I improve my memory when I'm practicing at the piano, right? Mm-hmm. So are there any things that you have experimented with that you notice can increase mental performance, physical performance as well. You know, I, I used to have a lot of brain fog. I used to feel very out of it and dopey and tired, even though I, I had more than enough sleep, mm-hmm. I would feel fine in the morning. And then like an hour in, you know, into the day or something like that, I just feel all just fuzzy and foggy you know, when I was you know, studying for the MCATs mm-hmm. as well. I just, I remember feeling like that all the time, but I also think about what I was eating. I was basically just eating whole grain noodles at the time because it was just quick and easy. And I just didn't think about it. And I always had brain fog. I always had uh, issues with that. And there was, you know, there's a book called grain brain, which, which goes into exactly why these things cause your brain not to work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your brain is made out of fat. It's very long chain fatty acids, 20, 22 chain fatty acids, DHA, EPA, all these sorts of things. They don't exist in plants uh, or fungi. And so you need to get them from your diet. And if you're not doing that, you're not building and maintaining and running your brain properly. Also, when you're on a, you know, carbohydrate driven diet and your insulin's up, you can get peripheral insulin resistance. You also get insulin resistance in your brain as well. So even though you have an abundance of energy, your, your brain can't actually, uh, use it, use a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Your brain's primary, primary energy source is actually ketones. People say that it's glucose just because when we're in a, when we, we, when we're in our, our fed state, so called fed state, which I don't think is our fed state. I think that's a pathologically driven hyperinsulinemic state where your body's trying to defend itself against high blood sugar because high blood sugar is, is does direct damage to your body mm-hmm. at a molecular level. And so these, these glucose molecules physically fuse to other molecules and destroy them and cause them to, to, to function uh, inappropriately. This is where heart disease comes from because you get this glycation of, uh, I think it's ApoB100. And this is a, this is a signaling molecule that allows to recognize the LDL cholesterol and take it up into mm-hmm. the liver and recycle it and use it. When you, when you've killed that receptor, the liver can't recognize it and nothing in your body can recognize it except for your, uh, the scavenger receptors on your macrophages. And this is why your macrophages eat these things up, gobble them up, gobble them up. And you get these large foam cells, which we see these uh, histologically. Um, and then, you know, something else happens, you have damage in your, in your arterial wall. And then, then these things sort of migrate in there and cause these plaques. But if you don't have that damage to the ApoB 100 mm. in the first place, you're never going to get the foam cells. 
And so that whole process shuts down. And fructose is more, by the way, than, than just glucose. So if you're eating fructose like honey, like fruit, which I, I really don't think are a good idea for people to eat, even though that's a popular thing that some, some carnivore ad carnivore ish, uh, you know, yes. advocates, mm -hmm. uh, are, are pitching for now. I don't think that's a good idea for a lot of reasons. And that's one of them, um, is that it, it causes more glycation oxidation and uh, destruction of these, of these cells. When you are in your so-called fasting state, mm -hmm. which I think is our primary metabolic state, your brain is running primarily on ketones. Now you still have blood sugar. So your brain can still get glucose and your body can still get glucose, mm -hmm. all the glucose that it wants. Your, your liver makes everything that your body, all the glucose your body will ever need and glycogen and so forth. Mm -hmm. But the ketones are now the main, the main driver in your brain. And so now all of a sudden you bypass, even if you have peripheral insulin resistance, you know, which you won't have if you're just doing carnivore, mm -hmm. this will bypass that. Now all of a sudden you're getting ketones, your brain, your brain works better. Mm -hmm. So those are, those are major, major, major ways of, of getting your brain better. After that, if you're, you're full on carnivore, it's just a matter of fine tuning things. And I find that the more pure I get, the better my brain works, the better my body works, mm -hmm. the less inflammation I have, you know, go, the last 5% of going pure carnivore gives you about 95% of the benefits. Like you need to get rid of this stuff. You know, you know, artificial sweeteners will raise your blood sugar. They'll raise your, your, your insulin. And when you raise your insulin, insulin forces energy into cells. It doesn't allow it to come out of cells. Yes. So even from, from eating artificial sweeteners, you've now locked down all the energy in your fat cells. You really can't access them anymore. Mm -hmm. And so you're not going to be able to get unlimited amounts of energy. You're not going to be able to, to uh, mobilize all your fat stores and just be able to go, 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 go and feel amazing while you do it. Finding the meat that, that you like most and makes you feel better. For me, that's, that's beef and high fat beef nice. and getting sleep is a good idea yes. and calm yeah, yeah. and uh, getting a lot of water, all the, all the basics but really being pure, pure, pure uh, carnivore makes, has made just a huge difference for me. I don't know if that, if you found the same. I absolutely found the same. And just hearing you say the pure carnivore, even without the stevia, without those little tiny mm. safe plants, like avocados, the fruits, you know, a yeah. lot of people come to me and they say, I can't possibly be as strict or pure as you because I already feel fine with some avocados and mostly meat, right? But I just feel so passionate about why can't you at least try 100% carnivore for at least 30 days? Because guess what? You're going to feel superhuman. Can you actually share more of what research you have found regarding why stevia is not safe? Because artificial sweeteners in general have been shown in various studies to raise your blood sugar and raise your insulin levels. Uh, likely due to you know your taste receptors, you're getting a sweet sort of sensation. Your body's already saying, okay, kick into action. We're going to get some sugar. And, you know, because it does that, you're also going to get, you know, the opposite side of that because you're not actually getting in carbohydrates. And so you're going to have this temporary boost and you're going to get this insulin level that's going to go up, but now your insulin level is going to be high and, but you're not actually bringing in carbohydrates. And so now you're going to get your blood sugars low and you're going to feel like crap and you're not going to be able to mobilize uh, energy that well. Uh, then you get a lot of the uh, sugar alcohols like sorbitol. I mean, these things, these things are not good for you. I, I don't, I don't know why people think that, you know, oh, just because it's not a carbohydrate, therefore it's good. This is a weird chemical mm -hmm. that your body is like, just not supposed to have. And, and they don't taste good either. I, I don't get that. Like feel it's like this sickly, gross medicine-y sweet <laughs> taste. And you think like, well, yeah. well, at least it's, you know, has something sweet in it. I'm like, I, I don't know why you would want that anyway. It, right. it, to me, it doesn't taste very appealing. A lot of people have problems with uh, like loose stools when they start carnivore. Mm -hmm. And most of them are from these sugar alcohols like sorbitol because they're, they're still using artificial sweeteners oh. or they're using like, you know, pre-workout drink or whatever. And they, these, these are an osmotic diuretic. So they, they actually draw water water into your colon and they pull water in, pull water in. So that you just get these watery, watery stools. This is what we use in the hospital when people are, are bunged up, you know? And so it's, um, it's, it's no wonder that these people have those problems. I already know that they're bad enough. They, you know, jack up your insulin and, 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 you know, yeah. you know, screw with your blood sugar and, uh, you know, they're causing, you know, loose stools and so forth. And a lot of people, when they go carnivore, they think about and they think about, you know, oh, I need to eat meat. And so what they do is they end up eating a lot more meat, which is great. You know, mm -hmm. that, that provides the nutrition that you need. But the main thing is not eating all the other things. That's the trick. 
you know, and that's, and that's what, you know, people uh, don't always get. Maybe they'll, they'll limit that a lot and which is, which is awesome. You're definitely going in the right direction and definitely going to help your health in a lot of ways, but you know, you really need to exclude these things off and, and just getting those last little bits of, of plant material away from you. It just, it just changes everything. You know, even a little bit of carbohydrates, a little bit of artificial sweeteners will raise your insulin for a significant period of time and you will derail your entire metabolic system, yes. you know? So even that little bit has a big effect on your body, which is why I say 5% has a much bigger effect than, than just the 5%. For me, after three years of strict carnivore, I noticed that my body is uber sensitive to non-carnivore mm-hmm. foods. And for a lot of people, when they find that out, it's like a turnoff to go full in carnivore. Cause they're like, well, what if I want to treat myself with something non-carnivore? Am I going to suffer for that? For me, when I have some black pepper, I notice the pain and inflammation immediately. I'm not sure if you yeah. are sensitive to that. You know, what I tell, what I tell people is all organisms by and large, every complex organism anyway, protects its, its baby more than anything, right? Mm-hmm. You see this in, in animals, but this also is, exists for plants as well. Our seed is a plant's baby, right? Everything protects its babies more than anything. And a seed is a plant's baby. A nut is a plant's baby, you know, uh, grains and all these things are seeds and they're all a plant's baby. So this is generally where you find the highest concentration of poison in the plant is in the seed and black pepper is, is absolutely a seed. And so is, you know, coffee bean and, uh, and, and other things like that, that we, that we eat regularly. Black pepper is going to have more of these, these toxins that cause uh, problems. And I certainly noticed that my hard rule is no plants, no sugar, nothing artificial. So I don't want anything in my body that isn't evolutionarily, biologically appropriate and adapted for it. When you're talking about reintroducing things, I, I don't think people are really thinking about it um, clearly enough because you say, first of all, you're saying, I don't want to stop eating a poison because then I might be more sensitive to poison if I ever want to eat poison again. True. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't eat poison. You yeah. know, and it's just like, well, you know, the problem is, is that every, you know, every year on my birthday, I want to do a lot of cocaine. And so I need to do cocaine every day. So I build up a resistance to that because what if I just do cocaine once and it's just like way too much and I like don't have a good time. So what I really need to do is cocaine just every day so that I have this, you know, sort of yeah. been the experience of it. Yeah. That's not really what any reasonable human being would ever think uh, to do. And it's the same thing. And, and again, and again, and again, I see people really treating food as they do drugs. And I say, this is bad for me, but I I like the effect, you know, I taste and, and so I'm going to do it, even though it's bad for me. You know, I know alcohol is bad for me, but I like being drunk. So I'm just going to do it even though it's bad for me Mm -hmm. or cocaine or heroin or whatever. You're trading some of your health and long-term happiness for short-term benefit. You know, when you think about something with food, it just, it just sort of tastes nummy. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that really that worth it? I mean, at least, you know, someone who is doing heroin really enjoys that, like really, really enjoys that. You know, I've never done heroin, I've yeah. never done meth or anything like that, but I know just intuitively that this is mm-hmm. something that is, that is really, uh, providing you know, a lot of fun for these people because you don't, you know, sacrifice your life, quit your, you know, lose your job, you know, desert your family and end up prostituting yourself under a bridge for something that's okay. Mm-hmm. You know, you only do that for something that's like, wow, this is just, I need this in my life. I don't care what happens sure. next. True. And so that's, you know, at least like they, they, they think that that's uh, worth it to them. Mm-hmm. I don't think a cookie is worth it. I don't think a cookie is, is worth you know, anything close to that. Right. Um, but as far as why people experience more, um, more inflammation yeah. and, and more problems when they reintroduce these sorts of things, right. well, it's quite simply, it's the same as, as, as the cocaine and the alcohol analogy, mm-hmm. whereas these are poisons and your body is becoming, um, you know, uh, resistant to it. And they're, they're building up a tolerance to it, just like you would build up a tolerance to cocaine and alcohol and other sorts of poisons, Mm -hmm. your body's going to start resisting this and it's going to fight against this. So you lose these tolerances 
And then all of a sudden you reintroduce this and all of a sudden you're bang, you're hit with the full face and the full brunt of this. And you can actually see what this thing's doing to your body. Mm -hmm. And you also have the contrast because you've now eliminated all these poisons out of your body and you feel just absolutely fantastic, amazing. And then all of a sudden it chunks you down to here, Mm -hmm. you know, when normally you're you're way down here, but now you see this difference, you know, and you're like, Oh, don't like that. And so you can actually see, whereas before you're eating so much stuff that you just have no business to eating. Yep. And you're always sort of feeling you have this baseline level of, of crumbing that you feel. And so you're eating a little bit more, a little bit less of something. You have just very small variations in that. Mm-hmm. But now, because you just feel absolutely fantastic all the time, you introduce even a mild uh, you know, irritant to your body, you, you can see it. I agree. A cookie's not worth it at all for all of yeah. that suffering. That's no reason to like not stop eating poison, you know, yeah. stop eating poison though, you know, like, mm-hmm. like, oh, but what if I want to treat myself sometimes? Like, well then go and treat yourself. But like, why would you keep exposing yourself to something harmful every single day and be harmed by it every single day yes. to avoid sort of a, a more noticeable effect you know, once or twice a year, just deal with it and feel amazing all the rest of the time. Completely agreed. So I'm trying to think of like the viewer's stance on why they would justify eating this poison, even if it's not every day, every now and then it's mostly to do with social situations. So for Mm -hmm. example, the person, yes, they're doing carnivore 95% of the time, but when it's big celebrations, like a daughter's graduation or a birthday party, they find that they are the freak in the room if they're not eating that poison. So in that situation, how do you justify like, nope, I'm still not going to touch that poison. I I think a lot of that has to do with our own insecurities and and perception because most people really don't care what other people do or eat and how many people are vegan or vegetarian and they have people bending over backwards to, to meet their dietary preferences. Mm -hmm. No, no one really has a problem with that. They just have things available that are vegan or vegetarian and they just eat that stuff and they, they leave the meat for other people. Well, why don't you just eat the meat and leave the the vegetable and salads for the other people? At first I was self-conscious as well. You know, it's funny enough when I was, when I was in my you know early twenties and doing this, I just didn't even think about it. Mm-hmm. And I, and it was, it never became, it was never a problem. It never came up. It was just like, yeah, I just don't eat plants. Yeah. And it's just like, no, I'm not eating that. It was just never a big deal. I didn't talk about it. But then when I realized that, oh, this is what I'm doing. I'm making a conscious effort to do this. All of a sudden I was like, oh, now I'm like self-conscious. I'm like, oh, and I had to, exp- I felt I had to explain myself. And after a while, I just realized like, no, I don't, I just, you know, <laughs> just do whatever you do. People generally don't care. Mm-hmm. And unless, if you don't bring it up, they probably won't either. And so if you just get going with your life and just go about your business and you just eat the food that you want and just don't talk about it, it, it generally doesn't come up. And if somebody, somebody does you know, do it be like, you know, I get like, you know, when I'm at the hospital and I, and I want to eat something and like, they know my order, you know, they'll just get, I get like 10 eggs and six, like long strips of bacon. Oh. And so it's just like, this is like three nice. plates with just piles of, of, uh, eggs and bacon on it. And, and it's funny. And so people look at that and be like, Oh, okay. <laughs> and yeah. they, they'll make some comment, but, mm-hmm. and then, so they'll ask me about it. And I just, I'm like, yeah, I just, you know, I only eat meat. That's what I do. I just do, yeah. do carnivore. And, the, and so, you know, a lot of times they'll be curious and just ask me about it. They, it's very hard for them to say, Oh, well, you're going to get fat or whatever. And it's right. like, well, clearly not. And so they, now they're asking me like, Oh really? But you know, but what, what about cholesterol? And what about this? And then I just tell them, yep. and you know, that's another thing too, is you can just arm yourself with the facts. And that's why, you know, I, I try to do the, these videos to try to educate people on, on what is really happening to your health and your body when you're eating certain things. Mm-hmm. And then they either just go like, oh, okay, that's cool. But most of them will actually start eating a lot more meat and they you know, go and, uh, you know, at the hospital, you know, people come in and start asking uh, for the Anthony breakfast. Can I just get the Anthony breakfast, just a bunch of eggs I and bacon. <laughs> and yeah. And so, you know, I've uh, a lot of people in my department have have gone carnivore, at least, you know, have started eating a lot more meat. You have these social situations and that can be difficult for people, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's mostly difficult because we make it difficult because we feel self-conscious and we feel that we feel sort of embarrassed that we're doing something weird, almost like we're not supposed to do it. And it does feel like that because this is something that we've been told for the last half century Mm -hmm. is really bad for you. 
and his, and his, you know, gluttonous and all these sorts of things, but it's not, you know, you're eating in a very efficient manner. You're actually eating less food. You're taking up less resources. You're eating, you know, concentrated nutrition. Alcohol is another one. A lot of people feel very self-conscious, uh, without, if they don't drink in a social setting, I had a bit of a leg up on this because I never drank during the rugby season. That's, that's a sort of a big accomplishment. If anyone who's been around rugby players, like most of them were, you know, know, abject drunks. And so at first I felt very self-conscious and and I really hated it. I was was really uncomfortable. And then the second time, then the, the, the next week I did it, I felt still really uncomfortable and I really didn't like it, but it wasn't as bad. Third time was basically neutral. I didn't care one way or the other. For, by the fourth time, I was like, I actually prefer this. You know, I can interact with people a lot better. I, re, you know, <clears throat> I remember the night better. I can actually drive home. I'm not wasting a bunch of money. Right. And uh, and it's actually funny, you know, watching you know watching drunk people act like idiots. It's hilarious. I'll still do some things sometimes, like you know, have some drinks with friends. I you know, last time I drank was at. Uh, a friend's wedding. Uh, it does affect me more. And I notice it more. I don't get hung over. I wasn't, I wasn't hung over at all the next day. Mm-hmm. Um, but I notice that my energy levels aren't as good. You know, I'm not able to go to the gym for, you know, three, four hours at a time and just, right. just have to drag myself out of there because I don't want to leave for three full weeks. I felt not my best. And I noticed that it's not until the fourth week that I'm able to actually do a proper workout. Drinking has to justify a full month of not feeling my best. That just doesn't happen that often, but it, but it can happen. And when it does, I, you know, I put up with it because I've made a deal with myself. Yeah. Okay. I, I understand that this is going to set me back for a month, mm-hmm. but you know, I'm going to do it. And so, you know, that's it. So you just have to, you know, be an adult and, and accept responsibility for your, you know, your poor decisions. Yes. You know? Well said. So you guys all make the decisions on your own. If it's worth it to you guys, fine, then just have a treat, have some alcohol here and there. But I think the biggest takeaway from Dr. Chafee here is if you want to reach your best self, the most optimal performance you can be at, eliminate every single plant food and just focus on animal foods. So you seem like someone who has very high discipline. You mentioned earlier, the tiger mom inside you. I grew up with an actual tiger mom. So (laughs) I have been bred to be very disciplined. So what about for the audience who's watching and they see us as someone who's just naturally disciplined, really high willpower, and they think that carnivore is only for those types of people. You really need to be disciplined. What would you say to these people? Is carnivore actually easy to do? I, I think it is. And I, I think that it, it really just comes from your mindset. If this is something that you don't want to do and you really do enjoy you know, sweets and candy and, and cake and so forth... Um, that's going to be difficult. It's like, you know, you can't quit smoking unless you actually want to quit smoking. Yeah. If you enjoy it and I just, I want to keep doing it. You're not, you're not going to have any reason to, to quit it. So it's the same thing mm-hmm. for me. It was very, very easy just because I knew that plants were trying to kill me. And like, you know, and, and, you know, I, I say that sort of, you know, facetiously, but you know, they, they really are in, in so far as you're trying to kill them, you know, they'll, they'll live and let live. Uh, to, to, you know, most extents, but if you're trying to eat them, if you're trying to kill them, they will defend themselves Mm -hmm. and they should, you know, they're, they're living organisms and uh, they can actually feel pain. They they actually have a sort of a a somewhat of a a central nervous system where they respond, you know, uh, feel and respond to pain and attack. They can communicate with other plants in their family. They can send off chemical signals. They can speak to each other through the roots and, and they can actually say like, I'm being attacked. I'm being eaten by this bug. And they can tell a specific kind of bug and they'll make the poisons to deter that bug. And the plants and trees around them will start making more uh, poisons towards that bug as well. So they, they can interact, they can communicate and they can, they can feel pain. What is pain? Pain is, is your sensation of damage to your body that you are now recognizing this is hurting me. I need to stop this from harming my body. That's what pain is. And it's uncomfortable and it should be because our bodies are being damaged. We have to take this very seriously right then. Mm. Plants experience that as well. Do they experience pain in the same way we do? Probably not, but they are, they are responding to and, and, and experiencing damage. And, and you could call this pain. So since I know all these sorts of things, and I know that eating meat is optimal, and I know that plants and sugar and all these sorts of things are very, very harmful to me. Mm. It's not, it's not hard for me. It, it was, it was very easy to just not want any of that. Mm-hmm. 
you know, it, it's, it's, I sort of think of it in the same way as, as lead pipes, you know, maybe you have lead pipes and like, oh, that, that water tastes, tastes nice. You know, the lead makes it, it gives it a nice crisp flavor. I don't know. But then you find out like, oh my God, you know, lead is actually really bad for you. It's going to cause, you know, you know, you know, liver failure and, and your brain to decay. I mean, like, well, God, I don't want that. Right. I don't care how good it tastes. I don't want that. Yes. And so that's, that's how I feel with these sorts of plants. So for me, I don't need to be disciplined because I don't want to eat that stuff. Mm -hmm. you know? It's, it's not something that I want in my body. Mm -hmm. And if people get that mindset, I think it's, it's a lot easier if they don't really you know, understand just the depths of how bad this stuff is for them. And it's like, well, is it really that bad? And yeah. so forth. Then, then, you know, the, the, you know, the nice flavor and taste may overweigh, you know, override that. And then you do need to have discipline. You need to force yourself to not do something that you want to do. But I don't want to eat this stuff. You know, when I was first doing this and I was like, okay, I'm just not going to eat plants. I didn't know enough about it. And for the first two weeks, I was just looking at everything that I couldn't eat going like, Oh, I can't eat that. Oh, I can't eat that. I can't eat that. Like, oh. yeah. And it was hard. And I had to be, I had to be very disciplined, but after about two weeks, I just didn't care. Obviously you have to be disciplined in a lot of things. You know, you, you have, if you want to be good to the piano, you've got to play the piano a lot yes. and you have to, right. you, know, you just have to do that. You know, and if you want to be good at rugby or, you know, athletically, uh, inclined, like you just have to train, you just have to put in the hard work. If you don't like it and are begrudging, you know, like that you have to do it, it's very difficult and you do need to have, you know, uh, uh someone pushing you to do it or just, go, okay, I'm just going to do it even though I hate it. Mm -hmm. And, and, but a lot of people, when they do these sorts of things, maybe it's, it's a, it's a grind at first, but eventually they really enjoy it and they love it. And, exactly. you know, and, and hopefully you enjoy playing the piano. I would, I, would I so. do. I do. When I first yeah. started, I, I despised it. And then when you feel those rewards, for example, Oh, I won a piano competition. Now I start liking it. So that's how I view diet changes. If you want to go carnivore, it may be hard in the first two weeks, but when you see, Oh, your skin is getting better. Your hair is growing. I think that's a lot of incentive to keep going. Yeah, I think so too. And my mom was definitely in that camp and she had to be very disciplined because she did not enjoy oh, going really? carnivore at first because she, she's a big foodie. She, she has like well over 500 cookbooks and she's read them all and used them all. And from all different sorts of cuisines from all over the world, she's just really interested yeah. and she really likes that stuff. And that was nice. My mom was actually a singer, by the way. She was a, a musician. She, she sang, you know, she's a classical soprano. Oh, beautiful. Um, so wow. yeah, I always grew up with, with music and we took piano lessons as a kid. My sister played piano quite a lot, but um, wow. uh, unfortunately I didn't get as many uh, lessons because I was, I was younger, mm -hmm. but love the piano. Absolutely love piano and music. Yeah. But my mom had a really bad time with the first month, she was just miserable. She was just all these things like, God, oh, I want to eat this. And this is garbage. <laughs> this is bullshit. And I like, just being really grumpy about it. And, you know, but I asked her, I was like, okay, but you know, how do you feel? You know, I mean, you're, yes. you're, you're not enjoying it because you want to eat all these other things, but you know, how do you feel? Yes. And she was like, well, I actually don't feel good. I actually you know, have low energy. I, I'm not, I feel really tired all the time. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay, well, you're diabetic and you're taking four different different medications to lower your blood sugar, but you're not eating any carbohydrates. Yeah. Have you checked your blood sugar? Mm -hmm. so, oh, well, no, it was very low. I was like, well, that's why you don't feel good. Mm -hmm. And so you can actually start coming off your medication. So she started peeling it back and all of a sudden she went home. Oh, okay. That's interesting. And she, within a couple of weeks, she was peeling back her medications wow. and a little bit more and a little bit more after a month, she had, you know, very, very good control of her blood sugar. And she was off a lot of her medications on a reduced dose. After two months, my mom uh, was doing much, much better and came off a lot of her medications and was nearly off all of her medications at this point and on a, a, one of the lowest doses of her insulin because now she was insulin dependent, mm -hmm. uh, type two diabetic as well. And she went to her doctor and she got her HbA1c checked. And so for the people who don't know, that's, that's a marker of how well your blood sugar has been controlled over the last three months. Now, remember my mom had only been doing this two months, but her three month marker had gone from 8.9, which is very high yes. down to 6.1, which is sort of the upper limits of normal for a non-diabetic. Wow. And she did this in two months and her doctor just looked at her and said, how the hell did you do this? <laughs> what the hell did you do? You know, diabetes is, is a progressive illness. It only gets worse. 
Yes. And, you know, we can, we can mitigate it and try to slow it through diet, lifestyle, and medication, but this only gets worse. This doesn't just go away. Yeah. And it certainly doesn't just go away in two months. What the hell did you do? And, you know, she told her, it's just like, you know, this is Anthony's sort of been doing research into this. And, and he, you know, he thinks that this is our you know, natural diet is actually a carnivore diet. And this is, you know, provides all these benefits and plants are harmful and so forth. And she was like, wow, I'd really like to, you know, his research and talk to him sometime. And so we, you know, I went and, and spoke with her and, and had a big, long conversation. You know, that was a good example of my mom at first really hating it, mm -hmm. but said like, okay, I'll stick with it for a month and just see what happens. Mm -hmm. And after a month, she herself said, gosh, this is, this is, this is such a big difference. This has made such a difference in my life. Right. I really do need to keep going with it. And then it becomes second nature. You're doing this and you're, and you're seeing so much benefits. You're just, you're really excited about the benefits. You're really excited about how, how much healthier you're getting and, and how much better you feel and the medications you're coming off of. At first, it can be a bit of a discipline because you don't really know how big of a deal it is. But once you do realize how big of a deal it is, it's, it's a lot easier to keep going. And it just becomes second nature. You get rid of all the carbohydrate addiction and carb cravings. You end up being the healthiest version of yourself that you can be genetically. I, I haven't met too many people who have gone carnivore, strict carnivore for a number of months and then come off of it. Some have, most of the time that's alcohol. Most of the time, they'll be doing this and they're actually feeling really good and really good. But then they just kind of want to go out and like, Oh, I just kind of want to drink. And then they go and drink and then they start getting the carb cravings again. And the sugar addiction sort of kicks up again. Nice. And maybe they think, Oh, well maybe I'll eat this, but they also forget that, you know, even if you decide and make the conscious adult decision to eat a, you know, eat, eat something, you know, non-carnivore or, you know, drink alcohol mm -hmm. or something like that, you're, you're allowed back on the team afterwards. You know, you're not, you're not shunned, you know, you're not, you're not exiled, right. um, you know, persona non grata. Like it's, it's, it's okay. You know, people, people have these slip-ups. I make the conscious decision sometime to drink alcohol. Mm -hmm. I don't then just go, Oh, well, that's it. I guess I just have to eat pancakes now. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, you know, you, you can just stop again. And I, you know, I talked to friends of mine on, on the rugby team in Seattle, who were, were trying this and they were like, oh yeah, I was just eating meat for a week. I've never felt stronger. I've never felt better. But then I went to you know, my, my parents' house for dinner on Saturday and I thought oh, there's just a bunch of rice. So I had rice. So I guess that's, <laughs> I guess that's it then. I never get to try again. I'm like, why wouldn't you just, and I was like, you know, you can just stop again. Right. You can right. just keep going. And it really, it just dawns on me. They're like, oh, I never really thought about that. Like, yeah, <laughs> you can just keep doing it. Slip up once, and then it's just like, oh well, I just don't have the discipline. This is this is never going to work. Right. You know, like give yourself a little more credit than that. You know, I mean, there's you know, there's a there's a process here, and and it's it's okay to to slip up, or even make the conscious decision to to do something outside of that every now and then. I don't, as far as eating things, but mm -hmm. once every year or two, I'll, I'll have some, I'll, you know, I'll drink something yeah. and that, and that screws me for a month. And, you know, I have to deal with that, you know, but the, you know, the correct response to that is not to then screw yourself even further exactly. and eat more poison and make yourself feel even worse. Like that's yeah. the opposite of what I would want to do. And I think when you think about these things in these contexts and you really educate yourself and learn about how, you know, how much of a difference this makes, and then you see how much of a difference it makes in your body, I, I think it becomes a lot easier to, yes. to maintain. Yeah. I think it's, it all goes back to mindset. So I think a yeah, lot of people, yeah. they are chasing perfection. And when they make a slip up, they start self-sabotaging and they just, they're just like, okay, I'm going all the way back to toxins and poison slip up as much as you want, but do know that you can always come back, come back to carnivore, go back to feeling amazing. I think we're all on our lifelong journeys here. Mistakes are perfectly allowed. Let's finish off with this one question. This is something I would personally love to know as a three-year carnivore, you are a 10 plus year carnivore now. So what's a typical day in your life? Obviously, what are you eating? How's your workouts? Also take us through a day of work. Yeah. So, uh, you know, most days I, I wake up and I, and I don't feel hungry, which is, which is really helpful. A great blessing from just a time management point of view, because, you know, when you're eating high density nutrition, you don't have to eat as often or as much. And so I can, I can eat once a day, you know, maybe twice a day if I'm working out a lot. And then if I'm working all day and then I've got surgeries all night, 
in my head, I'm like, Ooh, you know, steak really sounds good. I'd like to eat. But then I just go, yeah, I'm not going to be able to make it home until tomorrow, tomorrow night, probably. And my body just goes, right. That's fine. We've got energy. You're not going to die. And so I don't get that panic. A typical day, I, you know, I wake up and I just get ready uh, for work and I go, I don't, I don't need to eat. I don't make breakfast. I don't have to do that. So I save a lot of time in the morning. Then, you know, I'm at the hospital generally fairly early. It's quite busy in neurosurgery. It's just a very busy specialty. Mm -hmm. And so I'll either have clinics or I'll have, you know, on call duties or I'll have, uh, you know, in, in operating room. And depending on what I'm doing, I'll be busy with that. I don't need to stop for lunch. I, we don't get lunch anyway. We won't get breaks. You just have to sort of, you know, find a time to just stuff food in your face, but I don't need to. I, I just, I just can keep working. I can keep going. I don't feel like I need to stop. I don't feel like I need to eat. I just work, 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 work. After work, I try to, you know, get some time in the gym, at least something, just do something in the gym right. and just have that consistency where I'm just doing that something every day. Then I come home. And I'll just cook a big steak. I have, uh, you know, my refrigerator, I've done a couple of videos on how I, how I pack it with yeah. meat from Costco. And then I'll cut them up into steaks and salt them and sort of, it's not really a dry aging. It's more of a, I guess, a dry brining is what people call it. Uh -huh. And, but it, it sort of, it, the salt soaks in and the moisture comes out and it dries out a little bit. And so it browns a lot better cooks a lot easier and it tastes a lot better. It's just, it concentrates the flavor and it just, just is an absolute game changer mm. for, for me. I, I, I do this for every meat that I have, you know, chicken, fish, oh, you know, really? pork, anything. I'll do that with steaks as well. So I'll get like a whole loin of uh, ribeye and I'll cut those up and then salt them and put them on the rack. And as long as you're, it's on a rack where it's not touching and all, all, you know, sort of all the sides mm. are touching air. Mm -hmm. And so air can circulate around it you won't grow bacteria and it won't rot. It won't go off. And so you know, the worst thing that'll happen is it just turns into beef jerky, which is great because beef jerky is great. Yummy. And yeah, there's, yeah, there's no problem with it. The more it dries out, uh, the easier it cooks, the better it browns. It has some, sort of like a crunchy crust to it uh, af after a while, especially if you're, if you're cooking it in like, you know, a decent amount of oil, sort of like, you know, uh, you know, shallow frying it. Uh, it, it just, it actually crisps up the outside, which it, it make, gives it a really, really nice out, outer texture. And the inside is a bit more dry. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like a, like a, like a tuna sashimi sort of, uh, texture and, and feeling it, it just tastes really good. So I meal prep for like a couple of weeks, just by cutting the stuff up yes. and salting it. And so every night I just come back and I just grab a steak or maybe two, depending on how big they are and depending on how hungry I am mm -hmm. and just bring those out and I just cook those up and, and, uh, and eat them. If I'm working out steadily, I'll, I will be more hungry. I will tend to eat roughly twice as much mm -hmm. as I, I would otherwise. Mm -hmm. And, and that as a result, I put on a lot of lean muscle mass very, very easily oh. as well. I push myself very hard at the gym. And that's the main thing is pushing yourself to muscle fatigue to where you cannot do anything more. Right. And that really makes all the difference. Like if you go to 10, you're like, oh, I'm going to do 10 uh, reps of this, but you could have squeezed out 12 with a lot of effort and pain, mm -hmm. and then you need to do those. So it's those last two that I think make all the difference, just like the last 5% of carnivore makes 95% of the difference. Those last two reps make like 95% of the difference. People, you know, accuse me of doing steroids, but obviously my diet is is such that I maintain my musculature and my, yes. uh, my lean body fat composition. Yes. But also when I work out, I work out a lot harder than, than other people do. And I get a lot more benefits from that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's the difference. I've known people that have done steroids and don't work out as hard as I do. And they did not get the same results as I did, right. even though they were on steroids, yeah. you know, the steroids don't actually do the work for you. You still have to put in work, yep. but you can put in work without any of that nonsense. And when you are, when you're on a carnivore diet, your testosterone levels goes up, your HGH goes up, your uh, testosterone receptors go up as well. And so you are going to be able to get very serious results. So I always try to, to push myself very, very hard. So even though I don't get it, always get a chance to go to the gym as often as I like, or work out for as long as I like, I push myself very, very hard. Every time I work out, I'm putting on like a pound, pound and a half of lean muscle. So I went from 93 kilos up to 105 kilos in five weeks and wow. say the same body fat percentage. So that's, yeah, that's 12 kilos, kilos like 28 pounds. Mm. You know, I put on 28 pounds of just lean muscle mass 
Ah. in five weeks and of just, of just working hard. And, but my, my appetite literally doubled. So I was, I was eating twice the amount of meat right. that I was, right. that I had before that, just to maintain 93 kilo. If I'm working out steadily, I might like want a steak like halfway through the day, or I'll eat like a big steak and I'll wake up in the morning. Like, mm, yeah, maybe I do kind of want something yeah. and maybe I'll have like a steak ready and I'll just sort of eat that on the way to work. Or you can, you know, cut up steak into little, little chunks and you just have it in a you know, little container and you just, you know, That's use right. a fork and just, yeah, just eat it up. Yeah. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's, it's very convenient, but uh, yeah, that's a typical day. You know, a lot of work at the hospital, but which is, which is very much benefited by the way I eat because I don't get as tired. I can, I can work all night if I need to, it's not mm-hmm. fun. I don't necessarily uh, prefer to do that, but if I need to do that, I can, mm-hmm. and I don't get exhausted and hangry and That's anxious right. that I haven't eaten because I'm not getting these panic signals yeah. uh, because I'm not, you know, eating carbohydrates, which are telling your brain that you're starving to death yes. by dysregulating your hormonal signal, your hunger signaling pathways. Yeah. I always say carnivore is the confidence booster, but also it makes you more resilient to stress, high pressure mm-hmm. situations, being on stage, being a sports player. Right. So all of these things are just easier on carnivore. It's so awesome. Yeah. Well, they, they call it like a, you know, like a carnivore Zen where people just, you know, Zen out and it's just yeah. like, yeah, whatever you just deal with it. You know, sometimes I'll work, you know, anywhere from 90 to hours to 135 five hours was the longest I've done when I've had like, you know, because I'm on call like four days a week. And so I'll, I'll work all day. And if it's busy, which it often is, I'll be working all night and then all the next day, because I don't, I don't get the day off after that. And then if I'm on for the weekend, you know, I'm working from 7 AM Saturday morning Mm -hmm. until 8 PM Monday night, because I have to go to work on Monday after being on call the whole time. And on top of that, I'm trying to do the YouTube stuff. I'm trying to do uh, videos. I'm trying to, you know, write a book and, and all these other things and keep current and, and, you know, read up on, on my job, which is, you know, neurosurgery. And if I didn't eat this way, if I didn't have, uh, you know, the energy levels and the mental clarity that, that, that has provided, I would absolutely not be able to maintain any of this to any degree. So you mentioned now you're putting yourself there on YouTube. So here's a chance for you to promote yourself on where people can find more of you and maybe about this book as well. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm pretty active on Instagram and my Instagram is Anthony Chafee MD. I have a website called uh, the carnivore life.com and I'm going to try to put my different blog posts on there. And YouTube, I have a channel again, Anthony Chafee MD, and this is where I put a lot of my videos and my interviews. And I have my podcast, uh, the plant free MD, the book, I'm just basically arguing that, you know, humans obviously are carnivores, but that more specifically that the so-called chronic diseases that we treat today uh, as doctors are not diseases uh, at all, but in fact, they're toxicities and malnutrition, toxic buildup of species inappropriate diet and a lack of species specific nutrition. So namely too many plants, not enough meat. And, you know, so I argue this in in a lot of different ways and just provide a lot of uh, different evidence and, and try to just, you know, point these things out because, you know, we have a, a huge disease burden right now that simply doesn't need to exist. We are we are self we're self inflicting these these wounds, and the only thing you need to do you don't need a bunch of medication, you don't need to see a bunch of doctors, you don't need a bunch of surgery. The only thing you need to do is stop eating plants and sugar, and these things just go away. They just go away. And I've seen this in practice. I've seen this, you know, personally with patients and family members and, and myself. And I and I know the science behind it. And this is this is just a fact. If you eat this stuff, you will get poisoned by it. And that poison poisoning manifests as type two diabetes, heart disease, autoimmune disorders, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, autism. Okay, so all of these things don't need to exist, and they have all increased exponentially since the 1980s, when we said, stop eating cholesterol and fat, stop eating meat, eat more fruits and vegetables. You know, all these diseases increased dramatically right after that. Mm-hmm. That's not coincidence. Mm-hmm. And that's not, that's not genetics. Mm-hmm. Your, your genetic population doesn't just change like that dramatically in, in a span of 10 years. It can't, that's just not how population genetics work. So something happened in our environment. And if that's something happened in our environment, then you remove that you know, that, that harmful stimulus from the environment, the problem goes away. Mm -hmm. I argue that it's, it's from the food we eat. 
or don't eat. We're not eating enough meat. We're not getting basic nutrition. We're not getting enough fat. And we're eating a lot of things that cause harm and cause a lot more harm than people think. They think that, oh, well, is it that bad for you? How can it really be that? It is horrible for you. It is absolutely horrible for you. These diseases simply don't need to exist. We're living in a state with, with lead pipes, and we're only just starting to realize this. People like me are saying like, those are those lead pipes. Those are problems. Ah, you're crazy. We've always used lead pipes. You know, we've never not had lead pipes. We're like, well, dude, we, we actually started using these very recently. Nah, you're just crazy. You're a conspiracy theorist. Like, okay, but that's the problem. And so as soon as we are able to recognize this, then we'll get rid of this massive disease burden and we'll get rid of literally trillions of dollars in wasted uh, medical expenditures. I am so looking forward to the day that doctors have very little to do and make a lot less money. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that day. You know, and and maybe some people don't want that, and they want to protect their investment. You know, in the healthcare industry and so forth. Like, I want it gone. You know, I, I, you know, that money can go somewhere else. Those, they, those doctors can apply their knowledge and their expertise in other ways that actually help people, mm-hmm. as opposed to just perpetuating a disease state that is not helping anyone. Because if you just remove these foods, the diseases go away. Sixty percent of Americans have a chronic disease that does not need to exist. And they are not chronic diseases. They are poisoning. They are toxicities. You get rid of the toxin, you get rid of the toxicity. It it is that simple. It may not be easy. It may not be easy for people to do, but it is simple. It is very straightforward. All of our brains and our genius are going into treating these diseases and figuring out novel drugs. That's useless because you just have to stop eating this food and this goes away. So why don't you use those big brains of yours to do something useful for people? You know, the actual culprit is a lot of different things, but they all come from plants and artificial ingredients, you know? So you just eliminate that. You go back to a primal diet where you're just eating a biologically appropriate species specific diet. You will not have these diseases. If you get lead poisoning, what would you do? Oh, well, here's this pill that will you know, mitigate the effects of lead because obviously you don't want to stop eating lead. So we're just going to give you this pill that mitigates the effects of lead slightly. And so you die slowly over the next 40 years. And, that, and that's good, right? You know, give me money. Well, or you can just get rid of the damn lead and you don't need the pill in the first place and you just survive and thrive much longer. And so that's what I want to get people back to because it is, it is actually really, really simple. And people may not find it easy, but it is simple. Wow. Standing ovation for Dr. Chafee. Round of applause. Bravo. You are changing the world. And I just want to say thank you. I appreciate you for the hard work that you put in Uh, your YouTube channel, showing up to these types of interviews. It is very much appreciated. You are already making a huge impact in just the carnivore community, but you will for the world too. So thank you, Dr. Chafee, for being here. Oh, well, thank you. That's very kind of you. And thank you for having me. I've really appreciated it. It's my pleasure. Hey, carnivores. Thank you so much for watching to the end of the video. I do hope that you enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Chafee. I hope it was helpful, insightful, and inspiring to you. It certainly was for me. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to hit like and share this video with all of your friends and family. Again, Dr. Chafee will be one of my guest speakers in my upcoming April 30 day carnivore challenge. So I I really do hope to see you in the April challenge on Zoom. For more details and schedules on the April challenge and how to sign up, please go to svgmeetup.com or click the link down below in the description box. I will see you guys in my next video. Have a beautiful meat-fueled Gouda day. SVG out.